Someone very profoundly once said many years ago that if fascism ever comes to America, it'll come in the name of, li of liberalism. Before we begin, I'd like to ask all the yet you participate in society folks a question. How many people do you think Killer Mike has actually killed? Okay, so now that we've considered that, let's think about why someone who has no intention of killing people might take on the moniker of Killer Mike. There will be a quiz later. Rap music is the critically acclaimed 2012 album by MC and activist Killer Mike. Produced exclusively by Run The Jewels cohort, LP, the record delivers an onslaught of bombastic tracks, blending classic hip-hop aesthetics with the Def Jux founders' penchant for eerie melodies and glitched-out sonic landscapes, all with a healthy serving of Dungeon Family Southern twang on top. Lyrically, Mike is really hitting his stride on this one, channeling the likes of Ice Cube and Slick Rick, his nursery rhyme flow effortlessly shifts between aggressive strip club braggadocio and stark political commentary, painting a vivid picture of the black American experience that pulls no punches. Run the Jewels have since gone on to make many politically charged songs and public statements, with varying results. Their support of Bernie Sanders was… nice, I guess. And of course, Mike's apparent defense of black capitalism has not gone over well on social media. And it's your fault for buying into it. Question number two. What are the options for black people in America? To work for someone outside of their own community, or what? Think about it. Latin and Asian and European immigrants have business centers in most major cities that have thrived for generations. Critical race theory deniers will try to convince you that this is actually the fault of black Americans, and proof of their laziness and intellectual inferiority. So finally, what happens when black people rebuke capitalism and start promoting, say, socialism? Or black autonomy? or the unification of the working class. What does that look like? The violent and manipulative dismantling of the civil rights movement by the United States government is not a distant memory for the black community. Killer Mike was born in a time where he could not express his views about race or politics in public if they skewed from the capitalist norm. Smash cut to 2020, where Mike is asked to speak about the George Floyd protests in Atlanta. At no point during this impassioned eight-minute speech does Mike tell people not to protest nor does he suggest that his personal property is more important than human lives. What he does do is stress the value of community care, and questions the efficacy of disorganized large-scale protest in the age of militarized police and an archaic two-party political system that vilifies the poor. His statements reflect the ideals of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and the Black Panther Party. No one is saying black capitalism is going to solve anything. All Michael Render has done is draw a line in the sand. By stating that he's a compassionate capitalist, he is refusing to be a slave to white American imperialism. You are not a communist. You are a wage laborer in a capitalist system that allows you to ponder and debate leftist principles on for-profit social media platforms. No one is seizing the means of production here. While you post edgy memes on dank left from your cubicle, there are people in the world with more pressing issues. In his song, Reagan, Killer Mike explains what these issues are and who's responsible. The Ballad or the Bullet is Malcolm X's famous 1964 speech, his first after leaving the Nation of Islam. The economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we should own and operate and control the economy of our community. So are we just calling Malcolm X a capitalist sellout now? Where are we going with this? We brag on having bread, but none of us are bakers. We all talk having greens, but none of us own acres. The Conquest of Bread is Peter Kropotkin's 1892 manifesto that confidently declares anarchism as the pure synthesis of communist and libertarian values. Although highly influential, the book is often criticized for its idealism, favoring industrial output over environmental sustainability, and most glaringly, its lack of a comprehensive method of implementation. Worker strikes and boycotts will not change the fact that companies like John Deere and Kellogg's make environmentally destructive products that actively take advantage of poor consumers. Dual power structures are built to replace the means of production with more sustainable and accessible options. To build dual power, we need comrades with money and an understanding of business. Your commune in the woods is not an example of dual power. If none of us own acres and none of us grow wheat, then who will feed our people when our people need to eat? Let's take a moment to talk about land ownership in America. Trust me, it's worth it. In his 1785 book, Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson states that indigenous people 
never submitted themselves to any laws, any coercive power, any shadow of government. Their only controls are their manners, and that moral sense of right and wrong. An offense against these is punished by contempt, by exclusion from society, or, where the case is serious, as that of murder, by the individuals whom it concerns. Imperfect as this species of coercion may seem, crimes are very rare among them, insomuch that were it made a question whether no law, as among the savage Americans, or too much law, as among the civilized Europeans, submits man to the greatest evil. One who has seen both conditions of existence would pronounce it to be the last, that the sheep are happier of themselves than under care of the wolves. It will be said that great societies cannot exist without government. The savages, therefore, break them into small ones. Hmm. He goes on to say, We discovered that the tribes therein enumerated were, in the space of sixty-two years, reduced to about one-third of their former numbers. Spiritous liquors, the smallpox, war, and an abridgment of territory to a people who lived principally on the spontaneous productions of nature had committed terrible havoc among them. Hey, I mean, at least he's honest. Let's fast forward a bit and check in with him circa 1803. Should any tribe be foolhardy enough to take up the hatchet at any time, the seizing of the whole country of that tribe and driving them across the Mississippi as the only condition of peace would be an example to others and a furtherance of our final consolidation. Okay. So, by 1819, white settlers in the South were just over it, and committed themselves to eradicating the remaining tribes by any means necessary. This, in turn, forced the federal government to propose a series of agreements in a feeble attempt to save human lives. That's all the treaties ever were. The government's passive-aggressive way to protect indigenous people from racists. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 went ahead and said fuck it to all that, and forced tens of thousands of indigenous people into concentration camps and eventual death marches across the desolate Midwest. Sound familiar? By 1838, all but a few hundred members of these tribes had been relocated west of the Mississippi or killed in the process. The Homestead Acts were put in place starting in 1862 to give white unionists and immigrants the right to claim any land they saw fit to till, as long as it was, you guessed it, west of the Mississippi. Free black people in America were given this ability via the Southern Homestead Act in 1866. It's said that of the 6,500 claims to homesteads by black people, less than a thousand property certificates were awarded. The program was then repealed in 1876. Homesteading for white immigrants was allowed until, uh, uh okay, uh, the last deed awarded to a white homesteader was... 1988. We were looking for a, a new life, a different type of a, a lifestyle. And we started doing that down in New Jersey, but it wasn't a, a complete thing because we wanted to use a wood stove. So it seems that people starve from lack of understanding. Because all we seem to give them is some balling and some dancing and some talking about a car and imaginary matches. We should be indicted for bullshit we excited. Here, Killer Mike calls out his own people for engaging in black capitalism. Like everything in capitalist society, music is a commodity. It is marketed and sold just like any other product. Sometimes it's made by one individual, but more often than not, it's developed by a team of hired contractors. Some of these contractors bring real-life experiences to the table. Some are just good at observing and compiling elements of the cultural milieu in interesting ways. And then there are those who are trained in the art of generating hype and demand and have little to no connection to the music being made. If you want to be honest and forthcoming with your music, there's a market for that. But the Fast and the Furious is always going to sell more than Sorry to Bother You. Send the children deaf and pretending this exciting. We are advertisements for agony and pain. We escort the youth. We tell them to join the game. We tell them dope stories introduce them to the game. In 2012, the blog Hip Hop is Red posted an anonymous letter from a quote, decision maker at an established company in the music industry. In it, they describe a 1991 meeting in which a number of music executives admit to investing in the prison industrial complex and divulge their intention to use gangster rap as a literal prison pipeline for young black youth. The story is rather dramatic, but honestly, getting a gun pulled on you at a meeting in the Hollywood Hills is not all that far-fetched. I personally know recording engineers that have had guns pulled on them for less. 
The moral of the story is that there are a lot of violent, greedy people in the music industry. The artist that decides to make lowest common denominator music because it's easy and offers the highest return on investment is not the one we should be focusing on. Some of the stuff I rap about may not be true, but it's what everyone wants to hear now. Like all of North introduced us to cocaine in the 80s when the bricks came on military plane. Throughout the song, we hear samples of Ronald Reagan addressing the Iran-Contra affair a massive disinformation campaign used by the United States government to fund far-right terrorism in Iran and Nicaragua. Oliver North is the National Security Council member that facilitated and subsequently covered up many of these transactions, all while organizing attacks on small Marxist-Leninist nations such as Grenada and Libya. Senator John Kerry's 1988 Foreign Relations Report concluded that members of the U.S. State Department, quote, who provided support for the Contras are involved in drug trafficking and elements of the Contras themselves knowingly receive financial and material assistance from drug traffickers. North would be convicted of just three felonies, all of which were reversed on appeal in 1991. Want more reasons to hate this guy? Okay. In 1990, North started the Freedom Alliance, a foundation seeking to, quote, advance the American heritage of freedom by honoring and encouraging military service, defending the sovereignty of the United States, and promoting a strong national defense. Two months after the organization opened its doors, George H.W. Bush started the Persian Gulf War. The end of the Reagan era, I'm like level 12 old enough to understand the shit had changed forever. They declare a war on drugs like a war on terror. What they really did was let the police terrorize whoever. In 1986, Reagan signed a bill that allocated $1.7 billion to the federal enforcement of drug laws and specified mandatory minimums for drug offenses. Coincidentally, many of the countries said to be producers and distributors of illegal drugs also happen to be adjacent to developing Marxist-Leninist nations. The failed war on drugs has now cost America upwards of $1 trillion and has committed innumerable crimes against humanity in the process. Not only that, the recreational use of illicit substances is more socially accepted than ever. Yet, while wealthy white people open up dispensaries and invest in pharmaceutical opioids, millions of American citizens remain in prison on nonviolent drug charges. But mostly black boys, but they would call us niggas and lay us on our bellies with their fingers on their triggers. Gary Webb is the American investigative journalist responsible for uncovering the CIA's involvement in the 1980s drug trade, citing the Sandinista Revolution as the catalyst. He details the life of Oscar Danilo Blandon the Nicaraguan official who fled to California seeking to finance a right-wing insurgency in his home country. This would lead him to upstart kingpin Freeway Rick Ross, and with government escort, they would offer the city of Los Angeles high-quality product for $10,000 less per kilo than the going rate. And not trafficking in drugs because that was a cool thing to do or because that was their childhood dream, but because they were patriots. In 1992, Blendon was sentenced to four years in prison for conspiracy to sell cocaine. After 28 months, he made a deal with the DEA and got Freeway Ricky locked up on a full bid. They boots us on our head, they dogs us on our crotches, and they would beat us up if we had diamonds on our watches. They would take our drugs and monies as they pick our pockets. I guess that that's the privilege of policing for some problems. As I said before, in America, everything is a business. The police are in the business of arresting people. That is how the business of policing makes money. As we've discussed in previous videos, the legal system has made probable cause a commodity, and the employees of the police force are trained to seek out this commodity, if not drum it up. Let me repeat this. The police are in the business of probable cause. Mike has always been quick to point this out, yet on many occasions, he's been criticized for not being fully ACAB. This probably has something to do with him being born into a police family. So my dad was a police officer. My cousins are police officers. I am in strong support of police officers. I am in strong disagreement with arming and making police, um, police precincts paramilitary organizations that simply occupy whatever place they occupy for eight hours and then they pack up and they go home. But thanks to Reaganomics, prisons turned to profits because free labor is the cornerstone of U.S. economics. In 1987, Ronald Reagan created the Commission on Privatization, which sought to, quote, identify government programs that are not properly the responsibility of the federal government or that can be performed more efficiently by the private sector. Fueled by mass hysteria, the war on drugs sought to overwhelm the current prison system, 
forcing an apparent need for private capitalist intervention. Because slavery was abolished unless you are in prison. You think I am bullshitting, then read the 13th Amendment. Passed in 1865, the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution was not accompanied by any real reformation plan and allowed slave owners to just kick newly freed black and indigenous people onto the street. Except there were no streets. So now, not only do you have a bunch of people on the literal outskirts of society desperately trying to survive, you have every single slave owner in the country seeking a new source of revenue. Between them lies a large population of racist, power-hungry white guys that just lost their job as overseer at the local plantation. Involuntary servitude and slavery get prohibits. That's why they giving your ass time in double digits. This 2017 study from the Yale School of Public Health suggests that while black neighborhoods are more aggressively policed, and black people continue to receive far harsher sentences for drug-related crimes than their white counterparts, the epidemic of opioid and methamphetamine use in suburban white communities has led to a shift in police policy, favoring, quote, a rehabilitative role in judicial and correctional efforts as it relates to drug-related offenders. This is called systemic racism. Ronald Reagan was an actor, not at all a factor, just an employee of the country's real masters. A B-list actor from 1937 to 1942, Reagan was ordered to active duty by the U.S. Army Reserve, where he would go on to produce nearly 400 training films for the military. Elected president of the Screen Actors Guild in 1947, he spent the next several years providing names of suspected communist sympathizers to the FBI. You shoot them all? One of those who didn't get hung. Just like the Bushes, Clinton and Obama, just another talking head telling lies to your mama. Regardless of who is in office, the military-industrial complex makes the rules in America. Warmongering is not really a choice for those assigned to positions of public power. If you don't believe the theory, then argue with this logic. Why did Reagan and Obama both go after Gaddafi? Colonel Muammar Gaddafi was a Libyan revolutionary that led the Socialist People's Libyan Arab Jamahidiyah or State of the Masses, from 1969 until 2011. Engaging in a worldwide struggle against imperialism, he supported many international leftist movements, while nationalizing the country's oil production, providing free healthcare, education, and investment portfolios to the poor, and abolishing retail trade, rent, and wage labor. They invaded sovereign soil, going after oil, taking countries as a hobby, pay for by the oil lobby. As human rights abuses happen at home and all over the globe, America somehow manages to hone in on the spots where there are valuable resources. Humans, drugs, oil. It's almost like capitalism is inherently unsustainable due to the insatiable demands of capitalists. They only love the rich and how they love the poor. If I say any more, they gon' be at my door. Just like in the Run the Jewels track, Walking in the Snow, Mike alludes to having a deeper understanding of politics than he chooses to express publicly. And you still deny him the benefit of the doubt. Who the fuck is that? Stabbing in my window, doing that surveillance on Mr. Michael Rinder. Cell Therapy is the breakout 1995 single from Goody Mob, produced by Dungeon Family Masterminds, Organized Noise. Featuring an immediately recognizable piano loop, the sparse instrumental sets the stage for Cujo, CeeLo Green, Timo and Big Gip to inject street knowledge into the minds of young listeners. The song touches on violence, racism, and paranoia in the black community, comparing America to Nazi Germany, and plainly stating that white supremacy is in fact the new world order. Ronald Reagan paved the way for American corporatism, neoliberalism, and the brutal global imperialism many of us have observed since birth. Expanding on the ideas of McCarthy and Nixon, he demonized third world progress abroad and BIPOC liberation at home. In the process, he reinvigorated the average white American's belief in manifest destiny and finally gave wealthy industrialists the courage they needed to stand up to the cries of the bullying working class to announce, greed is good. Thanks for watching. Lots more on the way, so stay tuned. Hit us up in the comments and let us know what you want to see next. Shout out to all our patrons, past and present. This is my only source of income at the moment, so help a comrade out if you can, or just go watch and like all of our stuff. Hey, if you've made it this far, you're an amazing person and I love you. Good night and good luck.